Welcome to VegNet. These are a series of podcasts on commercial vegetable production presented by the Ohio State University Extension Vegetable Crops team. Today we're going to talk about pumpkin production and in part one we're going to discuss general culture of pumpkins. Did you know Halloween is now America's second most popular holiday? A few years ago it surpassed Mother's Day and Easter as, and is second only to Christmas. Americans spent $6 billion on Halloween festivities last year for an average of $66 per person. Because of this, pumpkins are now Ohio's third largest fresh market vegetable. For those who celebrated Halloween, 46% said they would carve a pumpkin, while 50% said they would decorate their home and yard. For the vegetable grower, pumpkins can account for anywhere from 15 to 40% of their annual gross income. Large retailers expect pumpkin deliveries soon after Labor Day. The word pumpkin comes from the Greek pepon. The Latin word is pipo, which is also the species name. The European roots refer to a large or ripe fruit. The French called it courge, the English called them melons. Courge was applied to both squash and pumpkins, but early travelers recognized differences between squash, gourds, and melons. The cucurbita genus has about 25 species, and they're monoecious, meaning they have separate male and female flowers. More on this later. Pumpkins are indigenous to the Western Hemisphere. They are among the most ancient of cultivated plants in the Americas. Cucurbita pipo originated in northern Mexico and in the U.S. They can be found in caves in Central America dating from about 7,000 to 5,500 BCE, which means before current era. Recently, 10,000-year-old squash seeds were found in Peru in the foothills of the Andes Mountains, indicating the development of agriculture very early. This was reported in the journal Science. The term squash and pumpkin are not botanical, and actually their meanings overlap. Cucurbita pipo is identified with a rough and five-sided angular stem. See the picture above on the left. This includes the pumpkins, summer squash, zucchini squash, and also acorn squash. Cucurbita machata is identified with a rough round stem. This includes the butternut squash and true pumpkins. Cucurbita maxima look on the right, the Big Max, is identified with a round, soft, smooth, and spongy stem. This includes the Hubbard squash, buttercup, turks turban, delicious types, and marrow. To grow a good crop of pumpkins, select any good, well-drained soil. Pumpkins do not like wet feet. A soil of medium texture is best. Also, the minimum soil pH should be 6.0. Site selection should also be based on previous crops. For black rock control, pick a site that has at least one year without vine crops. For phytophthora control, pick a site that for two to three years has been without vine crops, peppers, eggplant, and tomato. Also remember, good drainage is essential for phytophthora control. Now it is time to select the pumpkin variety that we want to grow. Important considerations are yield and fruit quality, fruit size and shape, which includes the fruit color and handle size, powdery mildew tolerance, and also virus resistance if it is available. An important virus is watermelon mosaic, also referred to as WMV. These pictures show the many sizes and shapes and colors that are available in some of the large and medium types of pumpkins. These are examples of small types, which are really popular if you do education with school children and bring them out to your farm. White pumpkins are also popular and especially interesting when used in displays with other pumpkins and winter squash. You can also grow some weird looking pumpkins known as the super freaks. As we said before, the selection of varieties with powdery mildew tolerance or resistance is of great importance not only because it can reduce the number and cost of fungicide applications, but also reduce the amount of fungicides entering the environment. 
Here is a list of some varieties that have 25% or less leaf area infected with powdery mildew. Of particular note is the variety Gladiator and Touch of Autumn, which have powdery mildew levels or severity below 15%. This graph shows how powdery mildew resistance in pumpkin varieties works in our favor. Notice that percent least severity on the bottom of the leaf is on the left side, or the y-axis, and across the bottom we have days after planting. From the 17th of July, or 48 days after planting, all the way over to September 4th, or 97 days after planting. Up to 55 days after planting, notice how there is little powdery mildew development on the bottom of the leaves. But once you get to 69 days after planting, Top four varieties are starting to develop powdery mildew. Now look at the section of the graph from August 21st out to September 4th, or 97 days after planting. Notice that the top four varieties start off about 20% powdery mildew leaf severity and climb rapidly up to a level of about 70%. However, during the same period, the varieties Warlock and HMX 6686 have not risen above 20% percent leaf severity on the bottom of the pumpkin leaves. This is a good illustration of how powdery mildew resistance can work in your favor and reduce fungicide costs and the number of applications. Now it's time to talk about lime and fertilizer. The best pH range for pumpkins is 6.5 to 7.2. The minimum pH should be 6.0. In terms of fertility, not too much nitrogen, but be sure to supply enough nitrogen and potassium. Excessively low rates of nitrogen, below 55 pounds of actual N per acre, and potassium below 100 pounds per acre, reduce the fruit size of pumpkins. A typical nitrogen program would look something like this. If you plan on applying 60 to 100 pounds total of nitrogen per acre, you would want to apply 75% of that pre-plant, and 25% side dressed alongside of the plants before the vines begin to tip. If you are using organic sources of nitrogen, be sure to calculate the total N available from moral sources such as cover crops and manures. Research in Illinois and Pennsylvania indicates 60 to 80 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre is really all that is needed for pumpkins. If you apply too much nitrogen, too much nitrogen the result is more vines and less fruit, Greener, greener fruit, fruit at the time of harvest, well. and pumpkins that do not store as well. Before, as stated be before, sure account for do account for all applied nitrogen plus residual soil nitrogen, plus residual nitrogen, soil nitrogen from, from legumes, sources, manure, sources manure and other and organic manure. sources. Now you are ready to plant. Direct seeding usually begins after the soil has warmed up to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This usually occurs around May 15th. Use only treated seed, and you can plant in hills, or you can actually use a corn planter to plant your pumpkin. Some growers actually use a transplant or cup transplanter, dropping the seeds in the cup just like they would a plant, and this gives them better in-row spacing. Plant seeds usually about one inch deep. If it's a dry spell, you can go deeper, but not greater than one and three quarter inches. For spacing, rows should be about six to eight feet apart, and the in-row spacing can be two to three feet apart. Spacing will depend on the type of variety you are growing. Some of the large types will require 24 to 48 square feet. Even larger types than that can require as much as 36 to 60 square feet. Medium types generally are in the range of 24 to 48 square feet. And some of the smaller medium sized types only require 12 to 20 square feet. The small varieties, you know the type usually 1 pound, 2 pounds, or 5 pounds in size, basically only require about 10 to 18 square feet. As we said in the beginning, pumpkins have both male and female flowers, which are separate. If you notice on the right picture, you'll see the enlarged ovule of a female flower at the base of the petals, where the picture on the left shows no ovule. The pedicel is directly connected to the petals. Male flowers and pumpkins form first, at the ratio of approximately 10 to 15 to 1 female flower. Under high heat and stress conditions, this ratio can change dramatically. The number of male flowers can go as high as 50 to 70 to 1 female flower. Most pumpkins will only set 2 or 3 fruit per vine, but the exception is with the new 
bush and semi-bush varieties which can increase that number. Female flowers on pumpkin vines are short-lived. They open in the morning around 7 or 8 o'clock. They are usually closed by mid-afternoon. They basically last only 24 hours and will fall off if not pollinated. The ovule begins to enlarge indicating successful pollination. Next we want to talk about irrigation. Pumpkins need water at critical times to ensure good fruit set and development. Moisture stress will affect fruit size but not number. Irrigation is practical in retail operation where lots of high quality pumpkins are needed, but irrigation may not be cost effective in large wholesale operations. In one experiment we looked at high input versus low input in pumpkins. High input consisted of plastic mulch trickle irrigation and a good insect and disease control program. Low input was bare ground, natural rainfall, and a minimum spray program. The result was that in two out of three years, high input had significantly greater yield than low input. In one year, the yield of high input was twice that of low input. In a study with magic lantern pumpkins, we compared trickle irrigation to no trickle irrigation, both with a standard fungicide program. Notice how the good orange fruit in terms of tons per acre and also the average fruit size on trickle irrigated magic lantern pumpkins is significantly higher than no trickle irrigation. There was no difference between no trickle and an untreated check. If we take a simplified pumpkin budget where we compare low input versus high input, look near the bottom where we compared total variable costs. Low input cost about $1,600, and high input is much higher at $2,400. But let's look to the right and compare gross returns. Low input gives us $4,000, or high input gives us basically $2,000 more at $6,000 per acre. So the higher input costs under high input are greatly offset by the higher gross returns or even net returns. Well, this concludes part one. Next time we're going to talk about insect disease and weed control, critical factors in pumpkin production.